So today I have a guest who is a uh, award-winning artist that I met at the 21 convention, the official event of the Manosphere. And he creates and promotes what he calls masculine art, traditional art, art that is beautiful and meaningful as opposed to the ugly Marxist art of today. As a result, he's faced a lot of opposition in the mostly woke art industry. And today he's on a crusade to make art beautiful again and to expose the ugly communist domination of the arts and entertainment industries. Thank you, Arthur Kwan Lee, for joining me today. It is an honor to be here, Mr. Hulse. That was quite the introduction. Was that accurate, or was there anything that I said there that was off base? No, that was that was all totally on point. Um, to to iterate that, uh, you know, I won 2020 International Artist of the Year during the pandemic, and I was blacklisted for essentially being pro-masculine, pro-freedom, and Christian, which tells you a lot about the dominant narrative and how toxic it is. So what is masculine art? So when you look at, don't look at university textbooks written by art professors, you know, do do not look at any of these theories. If you look at picture books, right? Nothing pretentious the way the galleries are today. If you look at the art that is meant to be designed for all people, Gardner's art history textbook is the most famous one that comes to mind. Uh, which is just a way of looking at pictures throughout our history. You will notice that much like there's self-evident things that are instilled in natural law. And one of those is beauty. Mm. Just like the good, the truth, reason, what is right. Beauty is one of those things that is self-evident. The same way a stench from something toxic is ugly. We don't need to have these fancy theories about it. What we have on our side is natural beauty. And when you look at art history and you look at all the greatest masterpieces, you cannot help but notice that they're all undergirded by religious subject matter and they're all produced by strong men. And that is something that I could not help but deny Da Vinci to Michelangelo to Raphael. And it's only until postmodernism came into the picture that all these theoretical forms of art came in. And I believe that that was a segue, a detachment from the accurate position of the artist, which is spiritual servitude. You know, artists are supposed to be servants. And we have forgotten that there's nobility in being that having that talent. And I believe that um, that's sort of my public statement on the matter, because in the absence of artists yielding their medium towards the culture's morale, they are immediately utilized by the state as an arm for propaganda. And that's happened time and time again throughout history. So if I understand correctly, you're saying that art is not subjective or beauty is not subjective. Beauty is an objective truth. How can you say that when different people find different things beautiful? So beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. Of course, there are different cultural predilections of taste, but beauty by definition is refining identifiable boundaries to the nth degree. That's why when you see bodybuilders or whether you see um, models, they can look different, but they have facial symmetry. But it, it's all about, um, you can look at like beautiful sports car as well. I mean, I mean it's, it's all when, when these lines are crisply drawn and it's not all over the place. You know, it's, it's not a um, physical vessel of, of chaos, you know, if when it looks orderly and upright, there's something beautiful there. And, and, and let me also, by the way, because we're talking about beauty, and this relates to what you just mes- uh, mentioned here, which is that often when I say the, be- the word beauty to men, they get it confused with hotness. In other words, when I say beauty, they think of ranking the opposite sex on the one to 10 rating scale, something of that sort, right? Right. But... But that's short term. And when you look at the ancients and all of our ancestors and even the modern thinkers who have been revitalizing these notions, whether it's Jung with the archetypes, Joseph Campbell with the myths, they're all they all understood, though, that our ancestors, what they meant by beauty, there's a pure beauty. And that is called the sacred. The sacred is the highest beauty. 
And that is something that we have lost touch with. And the, the role of the artist is to sort of um, consistently create modern forms that points towards these universal truths. But of course, in, in our day to day, it's all vanity, brother. You know, and, and this has been my primary gripe against the industry. So we're talking I don't about know if masculine question, art. What was that? Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of went No, you, a, you're a, doing a great it. job. <laughs> you're a smart yeah. dude, and I love listening to you speak. And so we're just going to kind of play these games with Q&A and see where it goes. <laughs> sure, sure, right? sure. Right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, and I have good questions, so we're going to have fun. Uh, so we're talking about masculine art. So art is masculine. You're also, or, um, objective art is masculine. Objectivity is, is masculine just as a as a, a polarity to subjectivity which is a bit more feminine i i think you understand can you maybe even yep. elaborate on that so art is objectively beautiful or beautiful is objective objective is masculine yes so 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 i can i'm going to prove this in a modern context because today the art world is gynocentric as you call it it's feminized and the evidence is because if you look at the people getting all their art degrees um, just to break this down, before the Frankfurt School wrote Art in the Social World, John Murphy, and created the art universities, before they came into the picture, it, all art training was atelier-based. So you find a master to study, and then you can create your own voice. You learn the rules to break the rules. Like any other form of creative expression, you need to first learn the trade before you say, this is what I do as an artist, right? So it was like that as well. And what happened is that these art universities popped up, and now they are the gatekeepers that are connecting you to the curators and art dealers. It's just, it's, it's this new, <laughs> totally different from the traditional rite of passage towards becoming an artist. And 78% of people who go to art universities are women. And there's all these guilds in conjunction to that, from the Guerrilla Girls to Women in Arts Guild. There's literally hundreds and thousands of uh, women's arts groups in conjunction to the, one, to the fact that all the people getting these art degrees are are, are women, right? So basically what comes into the picture here is you, when you go into the galleries, it's not so much about making a moral statement or creating actual uh, rendered artistic pedigree. You know, I, I, what I'm trying to denote with your audience here is that all of these, these subjects that you're uncovering, Elliot, they're also visually evident. And, and it's, it's, it's and interesting. And so what is gonna a make... feminist version of art then? A, a, an art that's subjective? Of course, but what are we looking at when we go to these galleries today? I can say it with one sentence. Masculine art promotes universal standards. Feminine art promotes aesthetic relativity. That's really what's going on. And so this is where down. we get so the if, difference if, between a, uh, say, a Leonardo da Vinci depiction of the Last Supper. Did I get that one right? Was he the one that made that? Good. So the difference between that and, say, for example, some of these arts that we see in the scene at New York City where it's a, a black canvas with like a red slash and somebody's eye, eyebrow. Yeah, so, so, so I gotta say, to, to be more nuanced, there's two things happening there. One, which is the actual, um, what, what the system of the art world is today has become so corrupt and toxic and it's become a financial instrument for millionaires and billionaires essentially. So there's a money laundering component there as well. But you have to understand that because that's going on, um, the more people who have a propensity to the more dark side of things, which tends to be on the radical left, the collectivists, they tend to also congregate there. And there's a gentleman by the name of Tom Wolf. He's an American cultural critic. He wrote in the painted word that this would happen, that because the art industry is becoming this um, underground sort of circuit for for tax evasion and money laundering because art is also an unregulated thing. It's like diamonds because that's happening that he predicted accurately that the radical left will also congregate there. So it's like the worst of both worlds. And, um, I guess what I'm sharing is that when you go into, you know, I had, I had most of my solo exhibitions in the lower East side in Soho area. And if you walked into a lot of these galleries, you know, you'd be walking into uh, the rainbow coalition art, BLM, feminism, all of these art that's, um, they're, they're, cultural propaganda in you know, artists essentially and they believe that, that they're being dissident even though they're a part of the dominant narrative right and then they, you'd walk into my show and it's all like religious figures and they go it was a contrast but because i was doing it in such a way there's an undeniable part of it 
that was still attracting people, that was causing sales. But once the critics started to ask me questions about it, and then the masculinity speaking truth to power, the words came out of my mouth. Um, I, I had no position there anymore. And <laughs> this is kind of how it's played out. Would you say that some of those um, radical left funded artists through the whole you know money, money laundering thing, would you say that their art is objectively beautiful art? What, 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 is, what is it that they're creating? And um, how is that in contrast to what you're creating? So um, that's at the top of the pyramid in regards to the industry today. And it's wrong that it's set up this way. So we're really talking about five galleries. Pace, Marion Goodman Gallery, Gagosian, David Zwerner, and um, Hosner and Worth. And there's two auction houses with the Sotheby's and Christie's. They don't even care about if the art is making, if it has any cultural value, which is what people should actually care about when it comes to art appreciation. What is the cultural value here? Right. There's no, there's no cultural value. It, they don't care because they select who the next stars are going to be based on whether or not they're part of the same ideological club or if they're philosophically compromised in some way or the other because right. they got them. So you have to either live under their shadow. They're, they're only going to give you that position. Like I would, I never worked with these five galleries. I worked right under there where I was sort of getting vetted. You know, there's a couple of galleries that, you know, I went to sushi with and all this, but then they started to sort of show that they, they they didn't have a good sense of boundaries, you know? And then once they discovered that I voted for president Trump, that also shook up the boat a lot with them. So it's, it's, it's a, you know, we've all heard this a million different ways. So you so, were canceled. Um, yeah, I was canceled, absolutely. And this happened two years ago, so, so it's, it's not as fresh, but when it happened, Elliot, it was, you know, I, I was, um, I, you know, I had six pretty good art galleries, man. <laughs> and now I'm independent, you know? Yeah. Which was, it ended up being the, you know, new opportunity for me, so. Right. So obviously there's the danger of the monopoly of the art industry because of opposing views, uh, not being welcome, uh, objectively beautiful art rather than subjectively ugly art. Yes, uh, I, I mean, un understand that, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. And I, and I shared this a little bit um, at the 21 convention, which is that, you know, one of the greatest works of art ever produced was a statue by the name of Pieta by Michelangelo. And it is wonderfully produced. There's beautiful, uh, the Madonna, who has Christ on her lap. And she's oh, looking yes. at her son. She's looking at her son like, like you're the chosen one, right? And also, he's, Christ is 33 years old, 33 years old in, in that position based on his, um, uh, you can just tell he's around that age range. That's what they've said. Mm -hmm. But the Madonna still looks youthful. And then they did that intentionally because they're trying to denote that a woman's value is connected to her purity. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these different layers that were like intentionally designed. And it's also formalistically speaking, not just contextually, the, the drapery, it's so like, it looks like silk, like realistic, but it's marble. Like that is mastery right there, right? So that's an incredible work of art. Right. Now in contrast, our Pieta, the architectural that I just mentioned, our generation's Pieta is this statue at LACMA in Los Angeles called the Levitated Mass. And it's literally just a giant rock that they put up on these two columns. And you can't help but think this is just insulting to our intelligence, but yeah. it's because, it, it, but it just goes to show you that when, you know, Yuri Bezmenov talks about how when people have deteriorated their morality, the facts don't matter, but also beauty doesn't matter. Right. Because only, only a person who believes that gender is a social construct and, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, masculinity is imaginary, like all of these. It's all subjectivity uh, again. Through. It's all subjectivity. It's been a exactly. slippery slope yeah. into subjectivity through the art, through journalism, through Hollywood, through the music, through the media, through basically every channel by which we grow as a people and express ourselves. Every single one of them have been dominated from this subjectivity, i.e. ugliness. Who, who, who's doing yeah, it's, that it's, and it's why? It's the removal of God. It's, it's, it's the removal of, it's, oh, look, I mean, this is such a kitschy thing to say, but 
we might need to find a, re a way to rebrand and repackage it, but it is, it is the death of God. You know, that's been talk talked about so much, you know, and, and, and my, I can hear a personal, I know this is anecdotal, but a personal experience to me uh, experiencing this, which is, you know, I just moved to Virginia and mm -hmm. uh, I just left New York City. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, my father's church is here, but I also, I also look for other churches as well, you know, so I can attend Wednesday service, whatnot. And uh, I'm looking, I'm driving around and all of these churches, I see rainbow flags and Black Lives Matter flags that are even higher than the, than the cross they have on the yard. Yeah. And I do not think that's accidental. I right. think that is a way of saying that the religion of the left has conquered the religion of Christ here. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just really debilitating. And I'm starting to see that like you know, Christianity in many ways has to get their balls back. We need to be uh, more intolerant, you know, mm -hmm. and, and this is what I'm starting to well, realize. Well, they're definitely and, and intolerant. I, the left is definitely intolerant. Oh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, no, no, but that's what I'm saying. Like intolerance isn't a bad thing. Right. It's something to be used for better or for worse. Right. <laughs> and it and, seems and, as if and, they're and, using and, it, and these very things that they call, you know, they will point out in others when they use it. It's the very weapon by which they dominate. Yeah, this is a, this is something that's like it's very dangerous, dicey water for me to talk about. But I, I'm always trying to talk about how. There's a lot of things that the left is doing effectively mm -hmm. that, I mean, we should be doing. And, right. and it's not because, of, co of course, there's this idea that you, should, you do not defeat an evil by adopting and practicing it. I understand that logical consistency. No, but, but at the what same I time, think has happened is they've perverted virtues. So it's about taking it back, using these, these powerful t weapons that they have exactly turned against us. And then we say, no, I don't want that. I don't want that because those guys use that weapon. But it's, if, it's, if it can be used for good, it's been made by God and it should be in our hands. And things like exclusion and being exclusive and intolerant has been turned around on those from which God or, or hopes to use it for righteous indignation and righteous boundaries and the unfolding of the kingdom on the earth. Absolutely. And, and, and this is sort of my mission. Of course, I'm doing this at like a personal level, but I really hope to inspire other artists to start coming out of the closet, to lack of a better word. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like we're homosexuals. It's crazy mm -hmm. how they flip. Every, it's all satanic inversion. Everything's it's been like, flipped. Yes. We sh yeah, we, sh we should not be the ones in, 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 hiding like this. Right. Right. You know, you know, you know, it's, it's crazy how the light is hiding from the shadow. Right. You know, it's, 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 it's really spellbinding. Mm -hmm. and, it is. And, and I'm at, I'm at the, yeah, it's, it truly is. And, and I'm just realizing that um, the only way we can actually turn this around is if we adopt a mean streak and yes. stop apologizing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's strange. Become masculine enough, so again. Like, become masculine again yes uh, mm -hmm. and um like I'm, I'm i'm doing this fight in the arts for some time but I, I gotta tell you that um as of now there's no way i can be in the traditional gallery it just there's no way mm -hmm. right and so where are the galleries that would be in communion with you that would support what you're doing uh and i think i guess what i'm saying ultimately is that we either have to take back what we've lost or create our own. And I'm not sure which so, one it is. So, so, so uh, look, look, um, th this is going to have to be a follow-up conversation in regards to creating on their own because I, I am, because of all my scars, right, <laughs> in these uh, in ideological battles, there is something that is in the midst. So, so, so that, that's, that's one part of the conversation, but that's going to need follow-up. Let I, me when, when ask you this. To present. Because we're talking about galleries now, and I'm not a gallery guy. I don't live in a gallery city, but I'm familiar with galleries and what they are. Galleries, sure. galleries in and of themselves are, um, they're made for and surrounded by a certain type of person. That's kind of been democratized in many ways today, meaning that as an artist, your gallery is on your, you, I'm on your website. That's a gallery. That's a legitimate gallery. It is a gallery mm -hmm. and it can reach 
just as many people as, say, for example, a, a, a box in New York City, right? Or maybe more, but just not the yeah. right. Maybe, maybe not the people that are go, they're gonna launder their money through it. What else can you do as an artist to, um, I don't know, it's, it's a, I think it's a new age for artists. Yeah, it is. And so you don't need their galleries so, and their shit. You got something else going on. Yeah, I, I, I don't need them anymore, Elliot. That's, that's the <laughs> blessing. So I, got, I, so, so, so I can tell if there's any artists listening right now to this conversation, I already know exactly what you're feeling. Yeah. If you have representation, like I'm, I'm going to talk to the audience right now. Like you're right now thinking, if I stand up for what's right and I speak up for the truth and tradition and most importantly, my own sense of uh, my, my sense of honor, right? If, if, I, if I speak up this way, I'm going to lose my sense of income. I will be castigated from my social circle. I will be jumping into a shadowy abyss and landing my face forward into glass, right? I know what they're feeling, right? But you'll be surprised. You're actually just going to be free of those constraints. Right. And you will feel the resilience of a man and, and to build yourself out from the ground up now. And that's what I've been doing. So yeah, now I'm online, man. So I almost want to, you know, but, but I will say that like traditional routes, you're right. They're, 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 it's different now. Like instead of getting patronage from one rich liberal that they have to constantly be in social camouflage with, you know, my new model that I'm trying to find is to get collective patronage, you know, from people who understand what I'm doing to, to put out art that is aesthetic and in line with their values. Right in conjunction to the fact that um, you don't need to collect or support galleries, you know, because that hate, that hate you essentially, because that's what's going on, you know? Um, and I've seen it happen over and over again. There's people who are very, who want to save the West, who do not stand for any of the liberalism that is widespread across this country and they love art because they are art collectors and they're they have an economic position to collect high-end art and they'll go into galleries that essentially will talk beyond their backs you know <laughs> because you're you're a money laundering tool essentially no 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 I, no I mean that doesn't happen to the whole art industry i never was that kind of artist but that's happening at the high end of the art world and that's what i'm trying to sh it's shed light on throat situation so i i think i remember you talking in another interview about how uh the patrons of the past were like those kings or the popes or the religious patriarchs. leaders hmm? they're patriarchs right of the time and i guess really the art is going to reflect who has the power of the time yes but but, but ideally and and this is why um it's ideally a, a benevolent leader that determines the art and, you would hope and, so. and you've seen that yes yes we would hope so i mean when you go to mongolia you sometimes wonder you know everyone talks about genghis khan was he a man who did widespread genocide in conjunction to widespread law or, or, or which side is it leaning more you know it's it's like it's like uh, but you know there's all this he's the most uh, depicted man in, in Asia. You see what I'm getting at? So right. it's like, it, 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 it really depends. But what we do know is now we can look back in history in retrospect and understand that we want to make sure that um, benevolent, powerful authorities who want to preserve the value of their culture support the artist. And it's incredibly important because the reason why the left has been so effective is because they do have ownership of the big five, you know, big tech, academia, Hollywood art gallery, and entertainment. So they have all the cultural pillars down. So we do all the red pilling, stoic data, the pie charts and the spreadsheeting, but they control the dreamscapes of your right. progeny and onwards. So it's very dangerous, you know? And I often say that like, it's because it's not as tangible or, or um, compartmentalizable, you can't categorize it as much with certain data. It, it seems more uh, flimsy. You know, it's so hard to grasp on because it's, right. it's, it's art, it's, it's aesthetic. But it's important to understand that just knowing that you have either a circle or you're supporting the type of artist that does have your philosophical values, that is enough because that's enough for the left <laughs> and, they're, and they're doing it, you know? <laughs>
So growing up, just a bias about art uh, that I experienced, and I'm sure many others have as well, is that art is somehow feminine, or it's somehow mm. more for girls. I remember the art classes being filled with girls while the boys went out and did other things. Um, what, what do you have to say about where we were in the past as it relates to art, where we are now, so from masculine to, uh, to feminine, and how did that happen? Well, first you have to trace when that sort of mantra came into the picture. Yeah. That came in when the majority of teachers were uh, in government schooling were taught by women. So you have to first of all notice when that sort of came into the picture, when they said, oh, artists are girls and all this. You gotta understand, historically speaking, art was produced by men. Right. And, 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 and not only that, it's funny because um, there's this. It's important that as we go forward, we we look at things holistically, and the, and what I'm saying is that, in the same way, we cannot escape our religious nature. That it's a part of man's psychological framework, and all men who are not, who do not acknowledge God, acknowledge the state statistically, in regards to how they vote by action. Everyone is aesthetic. It's just whether you're conscious of it or not. Now, let me tell you, Elliot, you're a gorilla of a man, but I'll also tell you most of the men, and I'm not saying you do this because I know you don't do this, but I'm saying most of the men who tell me art is aesthetically and feminine, they, are, they look like bodybuilders and they're possessed by an aesthetic ideal mm. and due to not having actual substance. And I often tell them, um, you do care about aesthetics so much to the point that you're spending hours at the gym weekly and I admire you for it, but... You're, you're pushing down other men who want to also pursue aesthetics in a different discipline. That's and right. it just, it's, just, it, it's just important to understand that there's qualities. This is the difference between atheists and religious people, basically. Religious people understand that there's universal parts of human nature you cannot get rid of. You cannot just move things willy-nilly and create heaven on earth. Right, right. And, 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 and atheists actually believe you can just negate these parts of your brain, but you're actually going into cognitive dissonance. Right. And, and this, is, this is why Jung is such a good new age tool, but ultimately he's really just a stepping stone towards religious practices. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 it's just really important for me to kind of make that clear that I have also noticed this pattern, Elliot. Every time men tell me, you know, whenever I've done talks with the manosphere, this and the other, they say, you know, I always wanted to pursue, you know, wood shop or, or, or ceramics or, or welding or painting or, but I never, but I just felt like, you know, it, it's, um, I didn't want to just go into a room full of girls. And I was like, right. Yeah. That, uh, I, I mean, and in my head, I go, yep, they got you. It's a social construct <laughs> that's made up. Yeah. I mean, I, I became an artist because my father, you know, that's the thing. So, I've so I'll, heard you talk I, about your father and, and from what it sounds like, he's a, a strong alpha male kind of guy. He's a, um, he's, he's a hard ass old school. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if, 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 if I talk to him about, if I'm, if he's like, he'll call me once in a while, I'll be like, Hey, how's it going? I'll tell him like what I'm into and what I'm working on. And then he's like, all right, cool. Just love you. Bye. Yep. <laughs> but, and, and, and that makes sense. Um, right. but yeah, he's a, he's, he's a, he's a, he's a military vet. Um, he's the generation of Koreans that went on the rooftops in LA and he's a pastor. So he's inconceivably based. Yes. Uh, but but you wouldn't notice because he's, he's, he's a loving man. He's just all love. He, he hugs you when he comes in, yeah. but you know, it's like you, but then you look deep in his eye. You're like, Oh, this, this guy used to be hard. <laughs> Cause he's older now. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah. um, there's a lot to be said for coming from a, a strong dad and he's, um, from what country? I mean, you have a super strong dad too, brother. And, and, yeah. and I'll tell you once again, Elliot, like, you know, much in the same way, how you probably got into strength training was, was you can probably denote a lot of that to the, some, uh, experiences with your father. Like I yes. became an artist yes. because my father pushed me to do so. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? It wasn't my mother. It wasn't like, it wasn't, um, I wasn't going to art class with a bunch of chicks. No, I was on Wikipedia and my father was telling me, yeah, go for it. By myself. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when, it, when, when people say art is for women, well, of course, all the, um, all the, the most famous artists today 
are basically homosexuals. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if even if they're even if they call themselves straight, they're they're really possessed by this feminine spirit. You know, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I often talk about how it's not a coincidence, guys, that the most popular aesthetic form in young people today is hip hop, because hip hop is actually an overcompensation of masculinity. That's why people are attracted to it in a culture that um, treats all all forms of masculinity as, as, as like a demonized expression. So in, in contrast, I'm going to wear thick gold chains, be surrounded by lascivious women, and double down with the profanity and, and almost uh, instill like a criminal kind of element to it. Because what's happened is there's no benevolent masculinity allowing men to appreciate aesthetics. That's a very good observation. It, the, the same reason why hip hop is, is a phenomenon is the same reason why Donald Trump was a phenomenon. Right. Trump, Trump's, Trump's rise has nothing to do with, yes, it had something to do with immigration. Yes, it had something to do with bringing back a patriotic sentiment against cancel culture and the mainstream media. But it was really essentially the spirit of bringing back dad. Men. <laughs> bringing, yeah. back, bringing, bringing back, bringing back, bringing back, you know, it's so that's why when that's why I, I felt this personally when I got canceled. It's like you're not canceling me because I'm a conservative. You're canceling me because conservatism implies masculinity, and masculinity right. implies boundaries. And boundaries, and, and you guys are what you began when you started talking about art. When you started describing good art, it's boundaries. We come full circle. And I love when you say that the aesthetic is spiritual. You say something to that degree. It's going to show up in the aesthetics. And so we have ugly art because we've rejected the father. We've rejected masculinity. We've rejected order. We've rejected boundaries. And we have the exact opposite. And you could take it how you wish, but it's an effeminized version of art. It's a dark form of art. It's a feminine form of art. It's a chaotic form of art. It's ugly freaking art. And you know... That, you know, I'm not lying because the art of the past, which was boundary driven and masculine, was beautiful. The art today that all these women are creating, and it's, it's not about hating women. It's about look at how ugly the art is and who's creating it and why. Absolutely. And not only was it beautiful, it wasn't pretentious, which is what you see today. Ah. People, when they think of the gallery, they think, oh, it's, I'm, I'm okay. They either feel excluded. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about appropriate rational exclusion i'm talking about that vanity right right pride um that that was all brought by women in the arts or the art gallery was for everyone yeah (laughs) and and now the art gallery is like a place where girls go to take instagram pictures and it's 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 a it's a totally different thing so it's a perversion um yeah I, i mean i i hate to say it but when when, oh man, when feminism came into the picture in the art world, aesthetic standards plummeted. Right. And, and so, so it's full circle, like you talked about. And, and what, but uh, what I'm trying to do is also show people: look, this is obviously something we can discuss internally and recognize. But I'm trying to say it's also externally happening to your aesthetics. Right. Look at the actual aesthetic. Look, look at actual women. Right. Like, look at the women who are going to schools, and then when they come out, they have blue hair. They have septum piercings and they're 100 pounds fat. I'm 100 pounds fatter. You see what I'm saying? It's right. like they, they, they look, they, it, it's, it's all aesthetics are deeply connected to people's morale. And of course, you don't want to meet a person who's possessed by just purely aesthetics because they can look good. But my point is that um, a person can look really good but still contain no class in their presentation, right? That's you know, right. there's a reason why that, that there, there, there's. You know, there, there's a reason why a beautiful woman who's wearing a nice dress is way more attractive than a woman who's wearing a uh, red mini skirt uh, with with a thong strap popping out. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you, a, a big part of like, uh, in order for us to create upright art, is for us to um, stop being perverted in our in our aesthetic desires also. This is another thing that you and I, I, I bet you would link quite a bit on just from hearing your position on the stance. Yeah. Uh, man, there's so much that we can discuss in that, in that realm. 
uh, but I'm happy that we're sort of touching on it. It's a deep subject and um, it has eternal ramifications or big ramifications for where we are, where we're going and um, God's plan on this planet. I would like to turn yeah, it's, from... It's, it's, Go ahead. No, I just want to say it's, 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 it's funny that it's because like, you know, um, we're both sort of living these holy lives, but from different positions. Hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's like we're both not promiscuous men. We're men of honor and we're both strong, but you're the family guy and I'm the monk guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. And so it's what's very, monk it's, life it's, like? It's, um, I mean, my life is in the studio, brother. And, and my thing is I'm possessed by, you know, I, I go where the art takes me and I'm always trying to create a stronger composition than my last work. So I'm sort of in that realm. But I got to say, as a man who is surrounded by Western modern women, uh, a big part of my direction as to why I'm living this monk life, it's not even so much. I mean, of course, a lot of it was because I, I have a passion that I do love more than sexual intercourse. And that has kind of been a cheat code for me in life. That's mm -hmm. always kept me out of trouble. Thank God. What do you that, say to people who call that sexual transmutation? How does that work? Elaborate. So there are those that say that if you retain your seed, you can transform it into amazing art or knocking someone out, i.e. Mike Tyson. And so that there's power to not blowing your load, chasing girls, having lots of sex. I mean, that's really obvious to me. Um, and it's simply, I mean, look, guys, anyone listening, I mean, you know, when you were, you know, when you started, uh, 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 squeezing your seal afterwards, you didn't want to do shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, it's a, it's very, it's not a baseline thing. Like, you know, if, if I, I can't, I mean, I, I can't imagine, I mean, that's just more, um, that's like your life, life force in many ways. I mean, not to get Freudian, but, but that's a big part of your life force. And if you have disciplined your mind to channel those forces into the development of, of a, you know, powerfully sound art and creating strong compositions. And you've, and that's a part of your psychological buildup and how you've grown your character as an artist for 10 years, speaking for myself, then you're going to be chipping out a part of the formula, right? Hmm. So that's, that's kind of what's happening for me. Like you, you, you know, when you talk about the sexual transmutation, I guess, um, that's just how you create your own definitions for your practice, right? Um, and, and that's just, that's a part of it for me. If, if I'm, if I'm chasing, look, I got to tell you, it's one thing if a guy doesn't have options. When I would have these solo shows, Elliot, I would, I would have a bunch of vain women inside the gallery, but I would not entertain that. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm getting at? Because I recognize it as an evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not even neutral, but as an evil, because you know that it can take away from you. And can lead down all kinds of rabbit holes that destroy men all the time. If if if, if the feminine if I recognize the feminine spirit in, in from an art historical lens destroying aesthetic standards as I previously right. stated, what would what would happen if I allow that feminine spirit inside my body and right. inside my heart when I go into my studio? What yeah. will that do to my art? Very good point. Your art would be perverted. That, that is that is biting the apple. Wow. It's so fascinating that you're able to see that and overcome your lower nature, but you're a smart dude. I mean, I mean, look, I mean, it's not, it's not always easy mm -hmm. because, because the higher up you go, the, the, the more temptation there is. Mm -hmm. But for me, it, it's just like, you know, it's not, it's not worth it, man. Right. <laughs> it's not worth it. Right. You know? yeah, yeah. And then you'd be creating ugly Marxist art. Yeah. Because Throw you'd, have to, keep, you'd, you'd have to keep her happy. You'd have to keep Jezebel happy and so you're gonna have to kill your own art <laughs> which makes me uh, you know kind of bounce around here a bunch but um back to sure. beauty because i think beauty is so important i remember when i reverted to the catholic faith came back home uh one of the things that was astonishing to me is this reverence for art and beauty and so there's the true the good and the beautiful i think that was aquinas and so yes. this reverence for beauty is seen throughout all of catholic history if you look at the monasteries, you look at the churches, you look at the just the stained glass windows, all the architecture, beauty, I mean, beauty beyond beauty. And that's when the West was 
a beautiful place. But I tend to think that, or not even my thinking, but my investigations into history have shown how our movement away from the church, Christendom, in the West, to even just a more objective Christianity, i.e. the, the um, uh, Protestant Revolution, right? The, um, Car- uh, what's his name? Um, Martin Luther. Just that split right there started to make Christianity more effeminate, more ugly, because long gone were the big, build, big beautiful architecture and, and the icons. There was even an icon, uh, iconoclasm where they, where they destroyed all the icons. And you know, I love icons. I got icons all over here. All the religious I art know. was deemed idols and needed to be destroyed. And so with the, the, that one big split from the church at that particular time, because mm. the Orthodox are still beautiful. Orthodox and the Catholic are very beautiful. But the Protestant, that revolt is indicative of the same feminist spirit that was a part of the Bolshevik Revolution, the French Revolution, and some might not he- like to hear it, but a part of the American Revolution. And it's all about this movement away from order, movement away from father, a movement away- towards more chaos and more individualism, more subjectivism. And so all you have to do today is, to, is, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but when it comes to the West and Christianity, because it was built on that, it, all its beauty comes out of that, you just look at the ugly Protestant churches today. They're like storefronts or these mega churches that just look like stadiums or just a box with a cross on it. And it just you could you could see the degradation of beauty, thus the degradation of uh, atonement with the Father, a movement away from order, and then just this subjective, chaotic individualist. I make up my own church, and thus now we have everybody with their own spirituality, right? When someone says they're spiritual, it just basically means I don't follow any order. I have no order in my life, and I just worship essentially my feelings. And this is where we are. Yeah, how many, how, how, many, how many girls did you know that said, oh, I'm spiritual? And you're like, no, you have to be specific. It doesn't mean anything. You can, be, you can be satanic and be spiritual. <laughs> so you have to be specific, right? Yeah. So, so, so let me tell you, the whole, the whole history of art in the church is a fascinating subject in and of itself. Yeah. So speaking of Martin Luther, we talked about the Pieta briefly, right? So mm-hmm. there, was a pre- there was a predecessing, um, one of the students of Martin Luther. His name was Donald Bramante. And he, was, he had the task of demolishing this chapel called the Chapel of Santa Petronilla. And the Pieta was in there. Now, here's the thing. I want to say something bold, which is that beauty always either exposes the hypocrisy of your enemies or the wisdom of your allies. It will show one of them. Hmm. And, I'm, <laughs> and I'm saying this because beauty is self-evident. Beauty is self-evident, Elliot. What yeah. we have as people who believe in natural law and God, we have beauty. So if people appreciate something beautiful, it will innately be pointing upwards and you can point that out. Mm. So this is what I'm saying. Beauty is a gateway drug to this. And I'm mentioning the Pieta because he had, uh, he had this Protestant view, which is, Bramante believed that, and this is, this, this, so, this is so lingering today, that the aesthetic appreciation is actually blasphemous. Because you should right. be reserving all of that spirit into prayer and ritual and shame. Yeah. So it's that same sort of, um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's the same spirit that you're talking about that still subsides in, in mm-hmm. many of these churches. And the reason why it's I'm a saying heresy. Because, well, well, he had so much art demolished, but he didn't, well, as he was demolishing this chapel, he did not demolish the Pieta. So even Bramante, and it, it, it shows his hypocrisy. Even Vermont, he had to secretly hide this because he realized this is too beautiful. Because it sort of hit, it, it hit him, different stroke hit him. And it kind of goes to show you, um, we need to, oh, man, the, the, the morally in line strong people need to support their local aesthetic artists like we need to we need to put them out there because as of now i mean they, they all belong they all belong to the woke brigade man you, you know um i've been doing my deep research in regards to this about 
it, it look, looking at this hypocrisy that exists by looking at the confiscated art collection of Adolf Hitler. Mm. And it was really fascinating because he was, you know, he was a part of this art collective called the Thule Society. And a lot of people don't know about Hitler's upbringing, but Hitler got to this position as Fuhrer from Rudolf Hess, who was supposed to be your original Fuhrer, because they were both in this art collective. Because art societies, just like the art world today, have a lot of underground transactions happening where a lot of nepotism and hanging out happened. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because a big part of being a part of the Thule Society was the outward declaration against Catholicism. Mm. And what, was, what, did Hitler, what, did, what did Hitler confiscate? A bunch of Catholic art that he stored in temperature controlled, well contained. I mean, he, he's preserving these things because they're beautifully done. You know, and then the CIA has now can like kind of show this hypocrisy, but it kind of goes to show you that like, you know, like I said, you know, you'll see this time and time again, whenever art is, is hit, secretly hidden or taken, it's from these people who are bashing it, but they just really just want to keep it for themselves because all these people are hypocrisies. Do as I say, not as I do, right? And this, this has happened over and over with all these uh, evil people. Mm -hmm. And it's because genuine beauty um, again, like, like for good people, they want to preserve it for the sake of what is true because the art is pointing towards that. But even for the bad people, they want to keep it for themselves. Right. Selfishly. So, right. so it tends because to show Because there's you that. still a draw to the beauty. There's, it may oh, yeah. be a perverted draw, but it's a draw to the beauty. And I like that you sort of brought up the fact that there's those who uh, wanted to hyperemphasize the spiritual over the physical. And that we shouldn't be interested in physical aesthetics, uh, but I, or aesthetics, aesthetics. Uh, I've learned recently about various heresies in the church, and I believe one was referred to as the Albigensian heresy. I could be getting this one wrong, but their whole take was that life is evil, and that so we need to reject the body, we need to reject pleasure, we need to reject beauty, we need to reject things of the world. And you still hear a lot of people with a puritanical mindset that say things like that today, that we shouldn't be somehow involved in anything that is sensual or beautiful because God wouldn't will it. But the fact that it has been uh, asserted as a heresy means literally that the church wants us to indulge in beauty, to create beauty, to love beauty, and to love our bodies, and to love the planet, and to love creation or yeah because otherwise that will be used against us and that's what we're seeing today. it's being used against us you know oh absolutely you know yep. um I, I i can i can give a modern parallel um well actually let, let, let me let me also say something i wanted to share that's connected to this whether it's Bramante, whether it's a confiscated collection of hitler during <laughs> world war ii speaking of speaking of world war ii you know, when they were going to drop the bomb onto Japan, nuclear bomb, uh, who was on the list? Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Kyoto. So Kyoto has all that wonderful architecture, all the fabulous aesthetic that people travel the world to experience. And all the wise, older men in this general roundtable stood up and said, we will not destroy beauty, we will not destroy Kyoto. Because if we lose our sense of beauty, we will lose our sense of humanity. So this is a very important thing. And this is something that we have to understand. We are in charge of beauty. And I mean, the fact that the fact that the left just has complete ownership of this, um, it doesn't look good. <laughs> no, exactly. you know, not, to cut, not to cut it at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so a lot of people, you know, they're listening to us. And of course, they're probably thinking, oh, Elliot, who's he to get to say what's beautiful and what's not? Right. Everybody thinks, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Well, I would like to share your art now. And uh, I think it would be a good contrast. But, you know, we don't have the other people's art, so we can't. It's not fair. But let's take a look at how beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> let's take a look at how beautiful your art is. And then maybe I, I can swipe through some of these from your website. You can tell us a little bit about their meaning. Would you be willing to do that? Sure, sure, sure. OK. Let's see. I want to get that piece between us. So give me a second. There it is. Okay, cool. So this is the first one on your website, ArthurQuanLee.com. You can see it up in the top there. And I like it. I like it a lot. Tell us what it is. What's going on here? So this is titled Rebirth. It's a, um, 
it's a portrait of a Buddha. And again, you know, because of my slanted eyes and yellow complexion, people often think I'm a Buddhist. I'm not. I'm not a Buddhist. Um, I've been attracted to different art historical aesthetics, mm -hmm. not to be so pagan. Um, <laughs> but but uh, but um, this portrait um, has all these doves flying that sort of symbolize flight and, and going upwards and being light. Mm -hmm. And there's all these... Like, there's all these feminine figures actually in camouflage in the back. All these like uh, women gazing at the man in the center, but he's closing his eyes, abstaining, and he's going upward because of uh -huh. it. So I always, I always play with a lot of symbolism often, Elliot, because symbolism is another tool that masculine artists have because we yeah. are by nature symbolic. Yeah. Wow, I like that. I, I like the birds or the doves. What are they? Those are doves, yeah. Doves. We ha we've we always had doves in whatever house Colleen and I lived with. And did you know that a doves are monogamous? Really? That adds a whole different layer to this. Wow. Yeah. Okay. There, you know, there are a few animals in, in the um, animal kingdom that reflect divinity in their human-like behavior. And so... Um, That's they, awesome. They, uh, they pair bond. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah, like wolves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so here's another one. This is interesting. I see a lion, but then I also see uh, the, the Marines putting the flag down in, um, what was that, Oka? Oka something? Oh, no, this is the raising of the flag in the Battle of Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima. And so tell me about this. So this painting was um, acquired by the Special Forces Foundation, which is an organization dedicated to supporting Green Beret veterans. And... It is in uh, a, a cigar club that I'm not allowed to be a member of because I'm too young, which, by the way, I love. <laughs> you, you, no, they, they only let you be a member once you're like 45, which is awesome. You know, mm -hmm. cigar clubs, martial arts dojos, and churches. They're like the only last old school spaces. I love it. Maybe some barbershops. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so, so there's this lion in there. And um, it's funny because when you look at the symbolism of the lion, in our history, there's all these mentions of strength, honor, and all these masculine virtues. But an interesting thing is when the lion is used in Christian art iconography, it represents benevolent fatherhood. Oh. I thought that was tremendous. I was like, wow, like that's even more specific, which means deeper. So yeah. there's a line here with all these cigar leaves because it's a place to, to, to lounge and talk with other men. It's like a philosophical space, right? And in the back is raising of the Ojima because um, so many veterans are a member of this club. It's, and many of my collectors are veterans or fighters or, you know, um, jacked often because I, I, you know, I'm sort of the artist, the luxury artist for the alpha males. So Alpha male artist, masculine yes. art. <laughs> How about this? So one? All, all, the, all, all, all the work here... Um, so, it, it, you know, my portfolio online is sort of a sample. I'm not mm -hmm. showing everything. I'm just so, showing works that have gotten a lot of attention and veneration. Mm -hmm. I like this um, one because, look, I have that tattooed on my arm that's Klimt. Klimt is amazing. Klimt is one of my major influences. And, um, I love yeah, it. Yeah Klimt, Klimt is, yeah, Klimt is awesome. So this is called Kissing Through the Ages. And this shows all the most iconic moments wow. of kissing in art history. All sort of put onto one canvas. I'm screenshotting yes. that because yes. I'm in love Screenshot with it. Screenshot that. Wow. Oh, beautiful! I gotta brother. send that to my wife. She's gonna really <laughs> like that too. Now, oh, where okay. is this piece? Okay. Second. Where is this one? Do you still have this one? So this one is still. Th this one is um, actually hanging in my home. There's some pieces that I've abstained from selling as well. I don't blame. <laughs> I don't blame you. Yeah, no, no, this this one's beautiful. But for those who are seeing this one, there's um limited edition prints of this one available. Yeah, uh, from your website. But, if I wanted to buy it, I can buy it. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think I might. Yes, sir. Oh, our anniversary is tomorrow. I wish I would have had it already. <laughs> but I'm gonna get oh, it. Oh sh. Okay, 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 okay. Really. Uh, I like this one too. Is this Nero? It's called para Parabellum. Yes. No, no. That's that's um that is that is Nero. Yes. So. Often when I do a juxtaposed piece like this, what you'll notice is 
the darker figurines are on the bottom, and then the middle tend to have warriors, and the top tend to have either celestial aesthetic or things that are uh, that are regarded or revered in one way or another. Oh, look what and I see here again. Her I love Clint, man. Clint is one of my great influences. <laughs> Clint is one of my great influences. I hate to be cliche, but there's a reason why he's he's a rock star. You know, Clint, uh, Van Gogh, and, and and Clint really embodied the masculine archetype of like the lover. He really did. He he wasn't he was people don't understand. He wasn't a simp. He was like the first painter, like literal painter, who told you know basically told told his family did the traditional model because at that time it was very hard for an artist to allow a woman to be a stay-at-home wife as wow. they found because of income at that time but Clint was a guy who was able to do that and his wife was just like this is my man here and he's you know what I mean so it's a beautiful thing that's amazing I didn't know that about Klimt and we love my wife and I love Klimt she, she loves it because I love all, it she loves anything all, I love oh there's all these photos of Klimt just like hanging out with his family like he was a family alpha male and, and, and he was rugged too He's like, he, he's, he's awesome. Clint is awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with me. And so I see, I, I see so many different things in here, man. So parabellum means if you want peace, you must be ready for war. The way and you that, create that the these the paintings are with a unique style, correct? Like you've sort of got like, I don't know how you, this doesn't look normal. It looks like you're kind of like creating dashes or s you're just moving all over with your brush I can imagine so, so Elliot I'm a big student of art history and I believe that in regards to painting nobody has really gone further than the impressionist in many ways because they, that's why they, I'm, I'm not hiding the hand now often the attraction to abstraction is actually a cop out for not having the necessary skills and techniques to paint properly Right. so often when people so, so you see that a lot, but the impressionists show that I'm able to render and show figures and show proportion and show that I understand uh, movement, but I also want to incorporate those abstract elements, but showing that I'm not doing it as a cop-out. So that's why I appreciate the impressionists. So that's what you're seeing, these little strokes. I'm not hiding my hand, you know? No, you're I'm not. Visibly showing, I'm visibly showing what I can do in my movement, but in conjunction to that, I'm also rendering because, you know, I would argue if you can't render properly, you know, you might as well go back to painting school. <laughs> a lot of these remind me like that looks like a scene out of like a Marvel comic book or something. So it's that's the Chili's. I know. It, yeah, he looks. He probably looks like, you know, uh, uh, back in the day when you were uh, doing the bodybuilding workout with uh, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love this dude. I like this a lot. Thank you, and brother. so impressionism is where you, you're using impressions. I guess that's what it comes from, huh? Yep, yeah. absolutely. So this is interesting. This is um, the more of the hyper-masculine side here. This is called Apex. And what we have here is central warlords and conquerors and warriors throughout history. At the top, we have the author of The Art of War, Sun Tzu. On the left, you have William Wallace. Wallace excuse me. And to the right, there's a samurai... Uh, I believe that's Hagashige. And then the bottom is Leonidas under that samurai. It's a little hard to see. And then and then we have Kim Yushin. He's like one of the most powerful uh, naval fighters. And then you have Julius Caesar and the Genghis Khan. And in conjunction to that are all apex predators. From the brown bear, the soaring hawk, that Siberian tiger in your face explosively ready to attack yeah. the killer whale. Yeah, wow. so this is like a warrior-esque piece. And it's not a coincidence that many of my collectors are fighters. Wow. This is beautiful, bro. Thank you, my friend. Cool. And so that's all at ArthurQuanLee.com. While I'm here, you can go. Absolutely. Yeah, so if you guys want to um, support yeah, you can what click it is that, that support I do, button. you know, yeah. Yeah, collective patronage goes a long way, guys, because I don't have the galleries no more. And then, but if you guys want to, um, and Elliot, I, um, I, I got you with a uh, kissing print. I'll send one over to you. You got. Oh, send my me internet's ad. off. That's why. Oh no worries, no worries. But 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 uh, but I'll but let me let me hook you up with a print, so you can. Uh, I would 
I would get, love a print of that. I have a place. Yeah, just to send, just to send me your address. <laughs> I'll text it to you. My <laughs> internet's going a little bit slow here. I was hoping to show cool, cool. some of what you have on sale. Hang out. I think there might be a way to fix this. I turn that off sometimes. I'm out here. And if you country. guys want it, if you guys want an original, just um, just set, click the contact and it will set up a a call. You know. Okay, Let's get some beauty up in your home, you know? Sorry about that. Yeah, internet's bad out oh, here in the country. Cool. Yeah. Some days you just don't want to do what it want to awesome. do, man. Yeah. Arthur, I really appreciate you, man. I appreciate you taking some time to talk to me today and having a deep conversation about the aesthetics of politics. I mean, that's really what it is, right? Left and right, masculine, feminine. Uh, we got the, the sort of dance that we've been doing for a long time, and it's... Uh, or this pendulum that's been swinging and seems like it's swinging back the other way and guys like you are leading the charge back to order, back to fatherhood, back to masculinity, and back to beauty. Yes, sir. Well, well, I mean, um, it's an honor, Elliot. We're two men on a mission here. If you guys want to follow what it is that I do further, um, I am heavily shadow banned, so when you look <laughs> me up on Instagram, you're going to want to type the full name, mm -hmm. um, Arthur Kwon Lee, all the way. Um, also, um, you can sign up to my Substack. I've been just starting that just in case, you know, because Substack is adamantly free speech. So we'll see. But um, I, they kicked me out again. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, and, and, and otherwise, you know, if, if you, got, uh, you want to collect, support, whatever you can do to help my culture fight here, it's, I feel like Leonidas here. But I do have an art collective also. So if you are an artist who, like, like, doesn't matter if you're a visual artist, if you're a photographer, a filmmaker, anything of that sort, I've put together this sort of rebel alliance mm. of create creative people to fight as a counterculture. It's called the Genesis Council. So if you want to join an art collective as well and do believe in traditional Western values or believe in God or just anything that points towards the truth and standing up for what's right, you can join the Genesis Council as well. So those are kind of, sort of my little um, name drops, brother. Yeah, that's amazing, man. You're doing amazing work, dude. And, um, and of course, we can find you at ArthurQuanLee.com. And so that's it. That's all. Thank you for joining me here today, buddy. And I'll talk to you guys again next time. <laughs> God bless you, Elliot. God bless you, brother.